Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's discussion on creative review and approval best practices. My name is Mike Peterbaugh, and I'm going to be one of your co-hosts today uh, for today's discussion. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started in just a few minutes. I wanted to cover a housekeeping item, uh, some quick housekeeping before we get started. Uh, today's session is being recorded and will circulate an email after today's recording or after today's discussion um, offering the recording. Um, all attendee lines are muted, uh, so please do feel free to use the Q&A feature in the webinar interface uh, to ask questions during the course of the discussion. And we'll answer those. If we can't answer them, if we see them when they pop up and we can answer them, we will. Otherwise, we'll take them at the end and we'll take them in the order that they were received. All right, with that, let's go ahead and get into today's discussion. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Mike. I'm the CMO here at Zyflow. I'm going to be one of your co-hosts, and I'm joined by Will Liu, our VP of Operations. Hi, everyone. Excited to have everyone on the call today. Uh, just real quickly, a little bit about Zyflow before we get started. Uh, we were founded in 2016 uh, by the original founding team of Proof HQ, uh, the pioneers of uh, online proofing. So there's a lot of uh, subject matter expertise in, in today's discussion. Uh, we have hundreds of customers worldwide that we're focused on helping um, these are largely agencies and brands with some of the most pressing review and approval challenges. And we're helping them solve that with our online proofing solution. And we're solely focused on online proofing, um, as well as delivering integrations with your existing and planned MarTech stack. Uh, so that's just a little bit about us. So let's get going. Uh, really quick, uh, we're going to talk about this toward the end of the call as well. One of the things that we wanted to offer for today's attendees was a free assessment, um, which would be a free one hour consultation um, of either your existing or planned and future looking uh, review and approval process. Uh, we will share insights from how our customers, hundreds of customers worldwide, both agencies and brands, um, approach creative review and approval, um, you know, covering a broad spectrum of um, subjects that we're actually gonna be covering today on today's discussion. Um, but we can also talk about it uh, specifically for your environment. Uh, and this is uh, open to you and your team. Um, so if you'd like to take advantage of that, uh, go ahead and visit uh, zyflo.com slash assessment. Uh, all we need is your email address to get started. And uh, that'll uh, kick off a questionnaire from one of our customer success teams. All right, great. Let's get into today's agenda. So for today's discussion, we're gonna be talking about creative review and approval best practices. We're going to cover four key themes, um, uh, specifically around internal, external, which we also call agency client reviews, multi-stage reviews, um, the difference and the kind of cohabitation of se sequential and parallel reviews, and then last but not least, something that is gaining a lot of interest uh, with our customer base and something that we've been talking quite a bit about um, more and more often with our customers is legal and compliance reviews. We've had a pretty good discussion set around that as well. Um, you know, our customers have seen a really big reduction in effort when applying these types of best practices, um, about half, a 50% reduction in effort, along with a 56% uh, increase as far as accelerated project delivery. So this is why we centered on these four um, best practices to discuss today. All right, well, let's get into it. Uh, and let's start looking at internal, external, or agency client reviews. So this is one of the more common approaches to review and approval, uh, the need to involve those outside of your organization or even your team um, in the review process. So after working through, you know, and the, you know, Will, I'm just gonna basically pose the question to you. After working through literally hundreds of these different implementations of creative review and approval, um, what are some of the key things that everyone should consider when they're taking a look at their own ex internal, external review and approval process? Yeah, thanks, Mike. I think there's a couple of questions that I always like to ask as I evaluate someone's workflow or we go through their imp implementation. A couple of the key things is who owns the client relationship and who should be communicating with the client. I think this is one of the most critical points as you really consider your internal and external review. Are there any protected resources here? Someone that you don't want visible to someone else? And ultimately, 
um, what and ultimately how do you control what the client or external colleagues see or not see? And what's the gate here? What is the internal sign-off procedure before you share it externally? And what are the drivers for a new version? So how do you determine when you stop taking that feedback and you create the new version? We have a couple of different best practices that we're going to talk about that highlight and answer a lot of these questions. And these are the questions that I feel everyone should think about and consider as they go through their internal external reviews. Yeah, I think these are all really good points to, I mean, even at the whiteboard stage, right, is to kind of sketch these out uh, and figure out if you can at least get some of the answers down because it'll definitely help shape your workflow. So let's start, let's get into the best practice and speaking of workflow, the uh, first uh, best practice, which is around uh, workflow and stage shaping. What are some of the things uh, people should consider as they're building out their workflow and stages? When I'm really looking at workflow and stage shaping, a question that I hear constantly is, what is a stage and who should be a stage, who should be in a stage? And there's a couple of ways that I've seen people approach it. You will create a stage for every functional unit that needs to review it. So you'll create a stage for editorial, you'll create a stage for copywriting, you'll create a stage for technical review. So you'll be you'll create a stage for each functional role in that's a part of it or you'll create a stage by groups of body. So you have your first review, your second review, your third review. And I think a lot of people really kind of think of their workflows in that, but my number one consideration or my number one recommendation for people uh, when they're thinking about their workflow and their stage shaping is actually visibility. And I feel that visibility takes a back seat to functional roles a lot of times, but I think visibility is really critical. And what I mean by that is, if I was to look at this beyond the single project, and if you're looking at uh, multiple projects, what do I quickly want to be able to spot? What do I want quickly be able to identify? A lot of times it's not going to be, it's in copywriting or it's in technical review or it's in editing. It's more of a group. So a lot of times um, when I'm looking at, when clients are looking at multiple projects, they want to know, is it being bottlenecked in design? Is it being bottlenecked in creative review? Is it being bottlenecked in legal and compliance? So visibility is really key here. Um, decision sign-offs are definitely very important and you want to make sure that you're getting the right sign-offs by each functional group. But if you're able to group together your editors, your copywriters, and your technical um, your technical reviewers all into a copy group that really helps with visibility. And then that feeds into the next section, what should be segmented? So for example, if it's something that's a work in progress, what groups need to communicate with each other and what should be a private communication and a public communication? So if your editor speaks to the copywriters a lot, you may want to consider putting them in the same group so that they can have private communication as well as public communication. If you separate them in groups, then it gets really complicated on how you allow them to communicate with each other. But uh, the two considerations here to recap is really visibility and communication. So how do you want to be able to see your projects at a high level when I'm looking at multiple projects? So those are the best ways to identify your stages and then who should be in each stage. Really think through how your reviewers talk to each other and what they need to communicate with each other. If there's a lot of collaboration happening between multiple reviewers, then they most likely should be in the same stage together. And I think that's a, this is a really good one to start with because I don't think that, that segmentation is always such an obvious, uh, uh, obvious thing to consider early on <clears throat> when you're building out your workflows and, and stages. So since that wasn't as obvious, Will, how about a really obvious one of what people should be thinking about uh, when developing uh, their, uh, their review strategies? So this one's gonna sound really obvious, but deadlines. Um, you'd be shocked by how often I ask a client what a deadline should be for a stage or a project, and they tell me something like, we don't use deadlines because they don't work, or we can't enforce deadlines on our client, or the most typical one I hear a lot is, we move too fast for deadlines. Um, but something really doesn't add up here because 80% of marketers told us they encounter issues getting feedback. And that issue just multiplies when you start 
including your external reviewers. So if 80% of reviewers or 80% of marketers are having issues getting feedback, but they're moving so fast that they don't need deadlines, something really doesn't add up there. And that's why I always recommend you, everyone using a deadline. You can pad your deadlines if you need to, but you definitely want to establish relative deadlines for any of your creative review, uh, any of your creative review, and not just on the overall project, for each stage. Provide a relative deadline for each stage. So if it goes into design review, give them a certain amount of days. Pad it if you need to. Say that they get three days or say that they get five days. But you want to set a deadline because deadlines are your guardrails that keep your review and approval on track. Deadlines really do two things. They help keep your proof moving forward. So they make sure that your proof doesn't get stuck because you have one stakeholder that hasn't provided reviews yet. Um, but if it does get stuck, it helps you identify who your bottlenecks are. So it helps you identify, okay, Mike is the one holding up my proof because I can see that everyone's completed it, but Mike's the only one behind schedule. Thanks, Will. I appreciate that. <laughs> Yep. And the largest amount of turnaround time is really actually spent on that proof management. It's waiting for someone like Mike to give his review or it's chasing down Mike to make sure that he's actually reviewing it. And that's where deadlines become key because these are the steps that you can use to automate your proof and tie in things like reminders. So without deadlines, you won't be able to provide reminders, but with deadlines, you can drive reminders. And reminders are, it's a little bit of art, it's a little bit of science, but you definitely want the ability to set different types of reminders. Advanced reminders work really well if it's a project that had a long deadline. At the time of reminders work really well if it is a project that's due within 24 to 48 hours. And late reminders are really great if it's one of those projects that are too fast for deadlines because if they miss it and you're moving quickly, so say you need someone to turn around in the, uh, the same day, being able to set a late reminder where it reminds the reviewer once the deadline's passed becomes really critical. I feel like you're trying to tell me something, but I was using me as the example of uh, someone who's <laughs> great in the process, Will. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is a really important one, too, because you, you talked about it as well, about being able to identify bottlenecks. And if your organization is one that is constantly looking at their processes internally, um, looking for ways to improve, uh, looking for ways to optimize um, delivery times, um, finding out, identifying these bottlenecks and identifying, you know, um, wh why deadlines were being missed. Uh, this can be really valuable information to just becoming, you know, a better uh, collaborative organization. Uh, so I think this is a really, really important one. Um, I, I think, you know, when we get into the next subject, Will, is probably one of the most, uh, the must-haves as far as a review and approval process, but probably one of the more tricky ones uh, with regards to how to get it right, uh, and that'd be versioning. Yeah, this is definitely a tricky one. Almost everyone I've worked with, um, intern, uh, this could be a brand, this could be an agency, this could be an internal agency within a brand. Almost everyone that I've worked with has some sort of SLA around the number of versions that they allow for creative, but they never seem to be aligned with it. So if the SLA is three and we really look at the number of versions that they provide, it could be upward to five or six. So the SLAs and the actuals are disconnected when we're looking at versionings. This is really caused because of two reasons. And it's whether um, it's the ability to identify whether comments are actionable or commentary or non-actionable. Um, when you don't have the ability to really identify whether comments are actionable or non-actionable, it leads to something where it leads to something that I like to call string commenting or string versioning. So I play a lot of poker, and a string bet is when I make a bet and then I add a little bit onto it and I add a little bit onto it and I add a little bit onto it to keep raising the threshold. And we see that a lot where there are, there isn't the ability to decisively determine whether an a comment is actionable or non-actionable, and that leads to string versioning. So someone requ someone requests a change, and you action on that comment right away, and you create another version. You provide them that new version, and all of a sudden they're requesting another minor change, another minor change, another minor change. So even though your SLA is 
three versions, all of a sudden you can balloon up to six, seven, eight versions because it's hard to identify whether comments are actionable or not actionable. My recommendation here is always going to be to establish some sort of system to filter and label on your comments. There are going to be comments where it's people just giving their thoughts and there's going to be comments where you need to make that change and being able to very quickly label comment to see, okay, this is a change we need to make or change we don't need to make is critical to the success of the proof and making sure that you're not overrunning on the number of versions because now you're not accidentally creating a version when someone was just thinking out loud. And this does two things. It provides, it provides the ability to really control your version. So before anyone goes offline and makes those changes based off the feedback, they know which one, they know which changes that they need to make. And this also leads to the ability to control your version numbering. The question I always ask after I ask, um, ask agencies, what's the average number of versions it takes them to create a particular asset or a particular asset type? Um, the next question I always ask is, how many internal rounds was that? How many external rounds are that? And really I'm trying to figure out is how much of this was self-inflicted or internal rounds versus external rounds or changes driven by the client. A lot of times the agencies don't really have visibility to it. They can't really, after the fact, look at a project during their retrospective and figure out how many changes were requested externally by the client, so client driven, or how many changes were the agency themselves making the fine tweaks before it gets to the client. And this is where the ability to distinguish between your version numbers becomes really critical. Creating a version numbering system where you can determine the difference between internal versions and external versions. So the ability to have, to track your internal versions as something like a minor version where it's iterating on the minor number. So 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3 versus the major number like one, two, three, four. That one provides more analytics and visibility to the um, to the team later on as they look at what was an internal round versus an external round. But two, it also avoids the question that clients ask when they get um, when they get version seven of a proof and they go, "Hey, where is version three, four, and five? I didn't see that. Should I go back and look at those previous versions when they were really internal versions that you were working through?" and it, it the one question that's automatically going to be on their mind is did I pay for that previous version? So to recap on versioning, I think the the two best practices that I would rec really recommend here is identify your organizational structure for your comments. So how are you going to label your comments and determine what's actionable and non-actionable? So this can go a couple of different ways, but you definitely want a way to organize your comments. I always like to say it's easy to remember three comments on two proofs, but we know from, we know over 90% of marketers are working on over four projects at any given time. It's never just three comments on any project. So create an organizational structure to really label your comments actionable and non-actionable in whatever way makes sense for your workflow, but you want that structure. And then two, for your versions, figure out how you're going to distinguish internal rounds versus external rounds. So how do you determine your internal minor versions versus your external major versions? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, as, as you said at the top, this one can be tricky and I think it's got a lot of downstream impact, not only in, like you said, how you analyze projects after the fact, Will, but if you are working in an agency slash client or internal external type of service provider relationship, um, you know, it's also, you know, what kind of signals do you want to send as well to your client? Um, so that's, that's a great one. I suspect that we'll have some questions in the Q and A. I just saw one pop up actually around versions. So um, I suspect that'll be, there'll be some more questions around versions. I know it is something that uh, a lot of people are thinking about. Um, at this point, I want to take a quick poll. Um, so we're going to use the polling uh, capability in the webinar software. I just have a simple yes, no question. Um, so answer yes, if you currently are, but how many attendees today are, uh, let me just go ahead and launch the poll. 
Um, how many uh, attendees today are currently retooling their creative review and, review and approval processes, excuse me, or plan to soon? I, I'm, I'm really interested in, uh, you know, how often and, you know, what maybe the driver was for people to join today's discussion. Um, something that we talked with our clients and customers about quite a bit um, is kind of a, a constant uh, evaluation of the process. Um, and, you know, why, you know, Will and I have talked about it a little bit already is, you know, looking back at, you know, deadline data, looking back at version data to try and learn from the process. Um, yeah, so it's a pretty good response, almost three to one now um, of uh, attendees are, are currently retooling or planning on retooling their creative review and, pro, um, review and approval process. Uh, that's great. Thank you for, uh, thank you for those who answered. I appreciate it. Uh, let's keep moving. Uh, let's do that. So we're going to move into now multi-stage review and approvals. Uh, this is a this is another I would say great one. Um, and will you know what are the things to consider um, when building or optimizing optimizing? And I think that's probably the key part, right? Is not only building it but then optimizing a multi-stage review. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. So a couple of really the key things to consider are who are the team members and what are the gates that determine when things move from stage to stage? So who are the people and where are the stages in your workflow? Is it always the same people on the same route or does it change? And when it, and if it does change, what changes? Is it something that is consistent? So is it different workflows per client, different workflows per asset type, different workflows per geo, different something per something, right? So what changes? So first determine where are the people, where are the stages, and then what causes it to change? And are your, what drives your projects? Are they decision driven or deadline driven or both? So um, are you working backwards from a timeline? Is there a hard delivery date we have to work back from? Or it, are we working forwards from the timeline? So the delivery date has a little bit more flexibility and we really want to make sure we provide the perfect asset. So just a couple of the really key things that you should consider as you look into building a multi-stage review and approval. Great. So then as we transition into what we would consider as best practices for these multi-stage review and approvals, um, you know, we're going to start right out of the gate with, um, I think something that could probably save a lot of organizations from some pitfalls as they start to build out, or really, as they start to identify who's going to be part of these um, uh, processes and, you know, what they're going to be driven by. Um, I think automated workflow is, it sounds like, um, you know, for those that don't already tr employ something like automated workflow, it may sound, you know, maybe a little bit extreme. But I mean, I think this is probably, you know, probably one of the biggest best practices that we could discuss today, Will. Yeah, absolutely. I think automated workflow is one of those really, really powerful tools um, that can get really complicated really quickly if you let it. So there's a couple of different things that I really recommend people consider as a best practice as they look at building out their automated workflow. Um, the number one question I always get here is, how many templates should I have? And the answer is really, it depends. I think the sweet spot is about three to four templates, but it varies based on a couple of different things. So um, the first one is really kind of, who knows the whole route? Who knows where the proof should go from end to end and what are the different stages that make that, um, the different stages that make that workflow. So that's really the first consideration when we look at the automated workflow. Who's kicking off the proof? And the person that kicks off the proof, do they know who it should go to? When we look at who kicks off the proof, the answer is almost always someone from creative, studio, project management, or traffic. And my follow-up question there is, do they know the whole route? So do they know the groups that should go to, the reviewers that should review the asset? And the answer is usually no. Um, a lot of times what we see is the person that kicks off the proof really doesn't know who the proof gets sent to, and they're really just the person creating that asset and sending it out to review. So it's the flexibility and the workflow really becomes key here, and having the flexibility to modify a workflow that's in route becomes really critical. Um, I really recommend having as little change as possible between asset creation and proof kickoff. So if your designer is normally the one that's sending out the proof now, even if they don't know the whole route, that is completely fine. Have them kick off the proof 
and then append a workflow after the fact. So the real, the real power of the automated workflow is now you don't need to rely on your designer or your, your um, studio or production team to know the whole route because the workflow will have that route encompassed. So really kind of think through kicking off the proof and how you can power these people to send it out faster for review. This eliminates that feedback, that, this eliminates that time where they're sending it off to someone else and that person has to upload the proof. That's just time that something isn't being reviewed and that's proof management time that you can take away by empowering them with a workflow where they can simply upload the asset and pick from a pre-existing workflow that already has the route defined for them. But the tricky part about the automated workflow is what's the best workflow to use? And my question here is always going to be, do your reviewers change and what determines if they do? So what are the minor differences between one project and another? And should you create a new template for that? And this really comes down to how much you want to automate everything. Some clients want to automate literally everything and this could lead to an overly complex implementation. The, the, or automating everything could be extremely beneficial. The key thing to remember here is that your workflows should be a template. So they provide the baseline for the route and they can be modified based off of what the specific need is for the project or the job. And what I mean by that is identify your stages, identify what's consistent within that workflow. So if you're always using the same copywriter or you're always using the same technical resource, then let's build that into the workflow. And then provide placeholders for the things that change. So things that will obviously change are going to be clients or things that are obviously going to change are going to be vendors. So you may want to build a vendor stage within your workflow, but leave it blank so someone can populate who that vendor is later rather than needing to build a workflow for each vendor or a workflow for each client, what, what I would recommend is really building that placeholder inside your workflow for them. And once you're applying that workflow, update it there. This way you can have one template serve hundreds of use cases if you're working with hundreds of clients, rather than needing to create hundreds of workflow templates. So my number one takeaway for best practice for automated workflow is, First, determine how much you want to automate and then figure out what can be flexible or not and what can be filled in via a placeholder because this is going to provide you the flexibility to allow people, more people to kick off the proof if necessary rather than being dependent on a handful of people to manage the entire route. I think this obviously has been a subject around, you know, trying to drive not only consistency but also efficiency. And um, obviously, you know, automating anything is going to help drive. If you automate it properly, like Will said, it's going to drive efficiency. Um, what our next best practice, I think, is one of those kind of uh, sneaky efficient um, type of things that if you can employ it in your process, um, will drive a lot of dividends as well. And that's the idea of having a reviewer on multiple stages. Uh, will, can you talk a little bit about this? Because I think this is something that maybe not as not not as always considered maybe in the analog world because as, as a big deal but once you start to look at automating and employing technology to do this maybe it becomes a little bit harder of having a reviewer appear on multiple stages yeah this is probably the single largest time adder when it comes to the creative review process that i've seen it's it's inevitably the question of how do you bring a reviewer back into the proof after they already looked at it um, if I have an initial review, a sanity check, and I've looked at it already, and I've made my comments, I've made my decision, how do you get me back into the proof to look at it again? We see this a lot with creative directors, for instance. They do that first pass on the proof, and then they also need to come back after everyone's given their feedback to give that final sign off and approval. One of the really unique things about Zyflow's automated workflow that I'm really surprised hasn't become a standard for online proofing is the flexibility to have the same reviewer in multiple stages in the creative workflow. Um, what we've heard from a lot of marketers is projects are held up by a single key stakeholder, someone that they're waiting on for review. And again, we really see that when there's a creative workflow that has some sort of initial check where 
I'm at the beginning of the creative review process. And then also I need to circle back later on for that final, final sign off or deeper review and bringing them back into the system or bringing them back into the proof always becomes tricky. Most, most people do this manually. They check on the proof constantly. Um, so they're constantly checking on the proof, seeing, okay, do I need to jump back in there? Do I need to jump back in there? Or they're counting on someone to alert them that they need to take a look at the proof again. So they're counting on traffic or project management to tell them, hey, Mike, I need you to take a look at this proof again. Will has added his comments. So can you, can you look at it again and provide feedback to his comments? And you're just adding proof management time there. So you're actually adding more effort into tracking the proof because now you're constantly checking on it or you're waiting for someone to tell you to go there. Um, and that's where it becomes really difficult if you can't have a reviewer appear on multiple stages because what you really want is a best practices here is to allow the system to tell them that, hey, I need you to come back into the proof. We're in this stage now and I need you to do this role. The other thing that I really recommend people to consider is what role for each stage of the proof should this reviewer have? I've seen a lot of workflows where people simply always have the same role. So in, for instance, the creative director will have comment and decision rights in the initial review stage, and they will still have comment and decision rights in the final stage. It's really worth thinking about what you need the reviewer to do in the subsequent stages though. So mm -hmm. if, do I need them to review it again? Do I need them to add a decision? So a lot of times what we find is in the first stage, maybe they only need comment rights or maybe they need comment and decision rights. But on that second stage, their decisions may differ and they may do something different. So uh, my recommendation here on multi-stage reviews is one, it, it should be a requirement, it should be a standard. It's definitely something that cuts down on the proof management time and stops the bottlenecks. But two, also really think out what you want them to do or what you need them to do. And it doesn't always need to be the same thing. And it speeds it up if, it, if you really identify that early on the onset and build that into the automated workflow. So, you know, we talk about adding, you know, people on multiple stages. What about the flip side of, uh, you know, multi-stage reviews, Will, as far as uh, maybe cutting down um, on the review um, process? Yeah, and that's a really good point, Mike. That's not to say you can't automate most of it. And there are going to be redundancies in your workflow that we should always identify on how to get rid of. Um, something I don't see a lot of people think through with their workflows is does my workflow for version one need to match my workflow for version two? So basically what I don't see a lot of people think about when they look at their workflow is after they've made their changes on the next version, what does that route look like? It's really easy to just say, I'm going to apply the same workflow for version one as version two. And most of the time that might be exactly what you need to do. But the question you need to ask is, does everyone really need to look at the proof again? What we really like to call this is the last mile. So this is going to be, if I think of this in logistics or delivery terms, UPS brings it to the general location and USPS brings it to the last mile. And if we think about this in our proofing route is, what decisions can we pull forward and who doesn't need to take a look at it again? For example, if I have a multi-stage approval, it goes through copywriting review or technical review, then design review, then legal and compliance review. If the legal, if the copywriting or technical team have approved it, but the creative team says that we need to make a design change on my next version, because the copywriting and technical team have approved it already, should they need to review it again? Or are we adding time to the workflow unnecessarily because we're sending it to this team even though they didn't make any changes to it um, and they said they were happy with the copy, but now they have to look at it again, proof it again, or simply open that email and approve it one more time. You're just adding time to the cycle when you could possibly skip that step. So really, the thing to consider here is 
what stages can I skip or what decisions can I pull forward because I don't need that group to look at it again because they've approved it. You won't always be able to use skip stages, but tying back to what I said earlier is if you can really group your stages into some sort of visible layer on who needs to work together, then you can feed that into skip on whether skipping stages is possible and eliminating time from your workflow because you're not unnecessarily sending it to a different group. I think so much of this comes down to collaboration too. And I think the point you made, Will, that I'd like to just reiterate is, you know, trying to identify which teams really need to collaborate when, um, and if that, you know, set of responsibilities has been met, those stages could be skipped. So, you know, logical groupings of teams is, uh, is a really important thing to consider. I mean, I think throughout all these best practices, but especially for, you know, being able to take advantage of something like skip stages, which, um, I mean, can really keep a project moving along. Um, let's amp up the complexity a little bit. <laughs> Not that um, skipping stages and, you know, version management wasn't complex enough, uh, but a topic that we, uh, we definitely talk with our customers quite a bit about is the idea of uh, sequential uh, and parallel reviews. And, and I, you know, I think probably the key point, Will, that I'd love you to talk about is this isn't necessarily a question of either or. Uh, I think that's one of the key points that um, we want to get across with our customers right away when they're trying to build out their uh, their review processes. Yeah, so let's actually define what a sequ sequential and parallel review is first, and we'll talk about how you can mix and match them. So a sequential or linear review, it's pretty straightforward. It's when different stages within the workflow follow some sort of sequence. So exactly what it sounds like. Um, usually that's is got to look like something like I have copy review and after copy reviews it and approves it, then creative reviews it after creative reviews and approves it, then account management uh, reviews and approves uh, reviews it after account management reviews and approves it, then the client reviews reviews it. So that's a sequential review. Essentially, I'm following a path and there's different things that determine what moves to prove forward along those paths. So normally de decision driven. A parallel review is when you have multiple or all stages in the workflow going on at the exact same time. So that means copy and creative and legal are all reviewing the proof at the exact same time. Great. Well, let's now get into then um, some of the best practices then as what we look at um, you know, when to choose which will, I mean, what, what, what really goes into when you decide, um, if you do need to make a hard decision, um, or how to employ both, you know, what goes into that decision making? Yep. This is going to vary depending on your specific workflow, but a really good rule of thumb here is whether the different stages need to interact with each other, quote unquote, live, right? Um, so does, does one team talk to another team a lot? So, the really good rule of thumb is whether the different stages need to interact with each other live, but are still responsible for reviewing distinct functions of the proof. For example, a really typical sequential workflow is going to be something like this. You're gonna start a technical review where a subject matter expert reviews the proof, and then after they approve it, it goes to copywriting. Um, this is a really, really typical sequential review. But this also could possibly add a lot of unnecessary back and forth because more than likely your editor, your technical editors and copywriters need to ask questions to the subject matter expert. And as we talked about earlier, the largest time suck of your creative review and approve process is bringing someone back into the proof. So if your technical review team approved it already, um, how does copy bring them back into the proof? as they need to ask questions. So a possible way to enhance this workflow might be to have your technical and copy review stages in parallel with each other. So each group of reviewers are still reviewing it for their functional area, but they can collaborate together when needed without needing to send the proof essentially backwards in the workflow. So now really minor, it looks like it's a really minor change in the workflow, but it's pretty key here. Now, technical and copy are actually happening at the same time. So as copies asking questions, as they are making notes, or as they need additional feedback, the technical team is still working there. I don't need to try to drag them back into the proof after they've approved it. They're still act 
effectively working on the proof itself. So creating a sequential work, uh, parallel workflow where technical and copy are working together and then adding the sequential elements after the fact where if copy approves it, then it goes to creative or if copy says changes are required, it goes to QA. Adding, adding or mixing sequential or parallel together really helps speed up the time and eliminate some unnecessary back and forth. That's great. And as we get into our last topic, I think this is a really interesting one as well. And I, it, this is something that um, uh, is an interesting topic, I think, for a couple of reasons. One is it's gaining a lot of steam with um, our um, customers um, asking us how we can help them uh, demonstrate um, legal and compliance reviews, both internal uh, compliance requirements like, you know, brand playbooks and whatnot, um, you know, brand usage, but also regulatory. Um, and it's also, I think, an interesting topic because it embodies a lot of the best practices that we've talked about so far. So um, let's just jump in here. I, I think there's a couple of key things to consider um, when your organization might be subject to legal and compliance reviews for creative content. Uh, and we looked at this as part of our survey um, last year, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, but I think, you know, one of the key points is for those of you on this call is, you know, GDPR and user privacy information isn't the only aspect of marketing compliance that really bears scrutiny. Um, obviously, if you're on this discussion and you're, if you took part in the, or if you joined this discussion today, uh, you're obviously interested in kind of the creative production process. And I think very much so there's the opportunity to uh, employ command and control um, over those processes so that you can demonstrate compliance, which is really what compliance is all about. You know, and one of the you know, key things to consider beyond that is, you know, which marketing channels, print versus digital, radio versus TV, um, you know, native digital, you know, um, only print, um, are going to require which layers of disclosure. And then, you know, depending on what the, those disclosure or those um, disclaimers or whatever those annotations might be on the finished product, um, you know, who's going to review them? Are there different review roles? Uh, for different types of content and maybe within even within different types of products or services within your organization. Uh, and something I just mentioned a, a moment ago is that compliance doesn't always mean legal. Um, are there brand playbooks um, in play? Uh, is that something that your organization uh, needs to adhere to? Um, do you want your creative team to be able to demonstrate that they are in compliance with those internal uh, brand playbooks? Um, fair uses. Uh, this is this comes into play. You know, we we see this quite a bit when um, some of our larger clients um, engage in like strategic alliances with partners, um, either you know via brand extensions or you know trying to enter in new markets uh, with a partner. Um, you know, they they basically sign up within contracts to uh, you know fair use and um, and app app approved use of logos and brands and trademarks as well. So it doesn't always just mean like, you know, the FTC and the, uh, and the SEC, it can also mean, you know, internal um, brand playbooks as well. Um, we, we do find that this is, you know, marketing compliance is becoming the new normal. Um, these are the survey results from last year that I mentioned before and that Will has alluded to quite a bit um, on today's call is that 78% of our survey respondents said that they were subject to at least one type of compliance requirement, um, be it regulatory, uh, being, you know, being able to demonstrate controls over the review and approval process for advertisements. You know, this is very, obviously, very impactful to um, organizations like pharmaceuticals, healthcare, health and wellness, financial services, et cetera. Um, in that same survey, interestingly enough, is that, uh, you know, 46% of respondents said that they still rely on suboptimal feedback channels. And what I mean by that is, you know, that's uh, kind of code for um, email, sticky notes, printouts. Um, you know, I would say less, less than optimal methods for demonstrating compliance. Um, I wouldn't want to submit an email thread uh, to the FTC to demonstrate how something got reviewed and approved uh, that maybe didn't meet compliance. Um, so that's also something I, th I thought was interesting that I wanted to share, you know, um, will probably be the subject of its own discussion on best practices in the future um, is, you know, what types of tools can you employ in the creative production process uh, to help um, you know, demonstrate control and compliance. Um, so here's a best practice. You know, I think one of the best practices around legal and compliance reviews is, is where possible, get more decision information, get very specific decision information. Um, most review cycles are fine with an approved or unapproved or approved with changes decision. 
Um, but those that maybe aren't or were specifically uh, disapproved because of a compliance concern, uh, can more information or context be and, and sh really should be provided? Um, this is for a couple of reasons. One is I think just the primary one since we're talking about this theme is documentation, right? So why didn't this make it out of um, you know the review process? Um, and and secondly, and you know more importantly, let's let's give the creative or the design or the copy team just a better guidance um, on how to fix the problem. You know, because, you know, the review and approval process just can't end at something saying change is required. Um, you know, we're not trying to, you know, generate more back and forth over email. You know, being able to demonstrate and, and supply more information around decisions uh, is something that can, you know, keep even something that has a compliance layer on top of it. Um, even a review process with that compliance layer, that review, that extra review and approval layer by maybe legal um, or, you know, the product ownership team or even a marketing compliance manager. Uh, this can, you know, that, that can bog a review process down. Um, but with more information like this, um, it can really cut down on the back and forths and just remove amb ambiguity from the next steps. Um, so again, what I said, um, I mentioned before, this is an interesting topic because it kind of embodies uh, some of the other aspects that we've already discussed that Will did a great job of giving us some best practice on before. And I think, um, automating um, role, um, automating your reviewer's role in um, routing in your workflow is key. I think this is a classic opportunity for a multi-stage review process that uh, Will just got uh, done discussing earlier. Um, the work in, pro um, work in progress stages can still be effective um, without the legal team quashing creativity early. I've actually seen that in my career, uh, working in the branding department at Intel. Uh, we used to invite uh, legal into some of these ideation sessions and uh, quickly we changed that um, because it was slowing it down. Um, so you can have your internal work in progress kind of ideation, you know, your versions one, two, three, and four, um, and then, you know, get out of work in progress for something that's uh, ready to review. Um, and you can employ things like minor versions, um, private comments, private stages, things like that. Um, but I think auto the, the overarching theme here is that automated workflow, um, it can definitely be um, a value add when it comes to, um, you know, getting, you know, really a, a embodying, you know, a compliance uh, DNA. Um, and that really leads us to our next best practice, which is documenting the review and approval process steps and outcomes. Uh, and I think this is something where, um, you know, we've, we've talked about it, you know, we, we've, we've given some best practices, but how do I actually demonstrate? And I saw one of the questions already pop up earlier about, you know, how do you demonstrate compliance? Um, you know, I think first and foremost is, you know, you create the templates for the review process. Um, but in terms of compliance, that's only half the story. You can definitely, you know, demonstrate the template as a, you know, piece of the command and control. But also being able to say, you know, who saw the content and when, as well as the comments and decisions that were made. Um, this information is really helpful in demonstrating, and I use that term, command and control over your processes. And that's really core to compliance. Being able to show that you have a process, the process was followed, the process was met, and it, and it turned into a positive outcome, um, that's really key for compliance. Um, so, you know, it also, and we talked about this as well on the call, is using the, you know, the best practices or the data that you learn or, you know, maybe the, the data points that you um, acquire along the way, um, this is really useful in identifying areas to improve as far as the process as a whole, is this documentation step. So. Um, you know, for those of you that are employing technology um, as part of your creative review and approval process, I definitely would, or are thinking about employing technology, I would definitely look for toward a solution that allows you to um, document, you know, who saw what, when, and how, the comments and decisions made, um, you know, when stages were started, et cetera. Uh, and then being able to, you know, quite frankly, very, and this sounds very tactical, but yet very important, be able to actually just get a, a portable version of your proof. I think that's key, is the kind of the portability of the proof information. Uh, it's one thing that we uh, work with our uh, customers quite a bit about is, you know, setting up their, um, their templates and whatnot so that they can export um, all the proof data um, at the end of a project. And they can save these as soft copies. I've, I've talked with several customers uh, who print out the PDF, put it in a binder and put it on a shelf as kind of like the belts and suspenders approach. Uh, and I think either way is fine, but just having that ability um, to uh, having that ability 
uh, to demonstrate that your processes were followed and the steps were met um, to you know, produce compliant creative content. I think that's the key. All right, uh, that was a great discussion. Uh, I think really quickly, uh, I just want to kind of go over, you know, you know, classic storytelling um, uh, structure. Tell them what you you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. So, uh, what do we cover today? Um, you know, I think there's a couple of key takeaways. Um, you know, Will, please jump in here as you see fit. Um, I think one is that automation of the review and approval routing can dramatically reduce the back and forth and accelerate your project delivery timelines. I think we talked about that across a couple of different best practices. Um, there's also best practices to follow when it comes to sharing your work um, with external team members. Now this can be external to you know, your team. It can also be in that, you know, that classic um, agent, um, agency client relationship. Um, there are best practices that allow you to keep your um, work in progress separate from your ready to review. Uh, and I think uh, those best practices can not only save a lot of back and forth, um, but they can also, um, even over the life of them, probably improve the relationships around those, uh, those collaboration um, collaborators. Um, you can have a multi-stage workflow approach that is optimized as new versions are created. Um, I think Will did a really good job of talking that through about, you know, being able to be flexible, um, uh, dare I say dynamic, um, as new versions are created. Um, and you know, being able to employ things like skipping stages or adding in new reviewers as well. Um, I think you know both sides of those coin are um, coin, uh, both sides of that coin. I'm sorry, I should say, um, are really important uh, when it comes to uh, really just getting really good about uh, review and approval. And then lastly, the topic we just covered, um, being able to demonstrate command and control of your review and approval process, is a key component of marketing compliance. There's you know several aspects that go into that. You know. Um, having you know autom um, automated templates or having a template for review and approval, um, identifying you know the roles and responsibilities, and then last but not least, just being able to have kind of like a portable copy of the review and approval process uh, that you can uh, pull out and uh, demonstrate um, as you know uh, the rigor around the creative production process. All right. Um, yeah. Sorry. Probably, we'll go ahead. Probably the only one I would throw in there, Mike, because I think this is a great recap is. Um, really kind of think through how you bring someone back into a proof after they've already reviewed it. There's a bunch of different tips and tricks. Uh, one would be reviewers in multiple stages. Another is going to be making a parallel workflow or making parts of your workflow parallel. But there's a bunch of other ways, but that's the number one thing I would say consider. How do I bring someone back into the proof after they've already looked at it? Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point, Will. Um, all right, so we're going to move into the Q&A session um, while I'm gathering the questions very quickly. And excuse me, I do need to get out of uh, presentation mode so I can get the questions. Um, while I am gathering questions, I just wanted to put up um, the offer for today um, once again. Um, actually, let me see if I can present back. No, I can't. Apologies. All right. Um, um, our free assessment offer. So if you visit zyflow.com slash assessment, um, will and his team uh, will uh, be in contact with you for a free one hour consultation on your current or your plant um, if you're looking to make changes. Um, we can definitely help you optimize, um, you know, going from, um, you know, current to um, optimized as well. Um, we, we, um, he's, he and his team will share insights from, you know, the hundreds of deployments that we've worked on here at Zyflow um, across, you know, many different agent, um, I'd say industries uh, in both the agency and brand context. Um, you know, large companies, small companies, production agencies, creative agencies, um, colleges, um, even. Um, there's a lot of different, um, you know, I think uh, insights that that team has to offer. Uh, and again, this is open to you and your team. So um, you know, go ahead and visit uh, zyflow.com slash assessment um, and uh, sign up. All we, um, all we need is your email address. Um, so um, I have the first question, I think this is actually specific to the product, uh, Will, because we showed a screenshot. Um, can decision language um, be modified? So, um, you know, the approved, unapproved, things like that. Um, you know, in our, and I, I think this is, a, a like I said, a question maybe specific to Zyflow. Yeah, in Zyflow, absolutely. So in Zyflow, you can rename, we call them decision labels, you can rename your decision label. So it, our standard ones are approved, approved of changes, changes required and not relevant. 
but uh, we actually provide you in Zyflow the ability to rename the labels so you can capture the decision however you need to. So you can change the proof to really whatever you want it to or changes required to whatever you need it to be to capture the decision in the way you need to. Great, great. Uh, next question is, how would you uh, handle longer documents like magazines or brochures? Um, I think it, there's no name provided on that question. So it might be a, there might be a couple of different angles on that answer, Will, um, from maybe a workflow perspective or whatnot, but also maybe just from a, a processing standpoint as well. So how would you handle longer documents like magazines or brochures? I'll give you an open-ended question there. Yeah, I would say it depends a little bit. Um, or whoever submitted the question, I would love for you to, to take part in the assessment. But from a top level, there's a couple considerations when you look at a longer document like a magazine and brochure. One, it's just the easy, the first way to think about it is when the content gets created. Very rarely is the entire magazine or the entire brochure produced at once. So you're doing it by sections. So a lot of times I actually say, let's review it by sections. Um, and then I, I always recommend grouping your subject matter experts together so that they know what they're reviewing versus the copy team versus the design team. So for me at a high level without knowing the exact intricacies of the workflow, I would say as specific sections of the magazine or brochure become ready, let's review and approve those. And then my workflow would probably look something like subject matter experts, copywriters, design, and then probably someone on the account side that does that final overall check. And I would most likely have um, a parallel review between copy, subject matter expert, and design, and then have the, have the account review be dependent on those three. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great approach uh, for those longer form documents. And we, we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of experience in working with, uh, you know, print houses, uh, organizations that deal specifically with print. And there's been a few things that we've added into the product over the last 18 months, I'd say, um, specifically for, um, you know, those constituents. Um, we also have a great blog post on the blog. Um, it's uh, one of the common pitfalls to avoid in online proofing. Um, and it speaks directly to um, those who are interested or um, responsible for um, print production. So it'd be something to check out for sure. Um, well, I think we, I think you talked about this. This was a question that came in a little early on, um, but it, you know, I might as well just repeat it to make sure we answer it. Um, are there any best practices for how to add in a team member while the process is already underway? Um, so it sounds like maybe, you know, um, a subject matter got identified late or a new team member or just someone got added as a stakeholder potentially. Yeah, um, I think the big thing to consider there is whether you add them to existing stage or whether you create a brand new stage for them. The, the kind of basic rule of thumb, the, the test that I like to apply is deadline. Um, like I said, I'm really big on deadlines. I think it's an obvious thing that a lot of people miss. So when you're looking to bring in someone after the fact and there's already a workflow and route and you're making that decision, should they go into existing stage or should they go into a new stage? Think about the deadline. Will they fit into the existing deadline on that stage or because they're coming in after the fact, do they need a new deadline? If they need a new deadline, it's best to create a new stage for them. But if they can fit logically into an existing stage, just from a tracking purpose or keeping the proof moving, that will be the cleanest way. But I really like to think of it from a deadline-driven perspective of, of where are we got to plug them in and how does the deadline influence how we're going to plug them in. Great. Uh, a couple more questions. Great. And I want to thank everyone for um, adding in the questions. That's, this is what makes these uh, discussions worthwhile. Um, can you talk a little bit, Will, about reporting um, and what kind of data points you would look on, look at um, as far as trying, we talked about, you know, learning from the data um, and trying to get better about our review and approval processes. Um, we have a question specific, I think it's again about Zyflow, the product about reporting capabilities, um, but which we do have, um, but, you know, maybe we could talk about it in a little bit of broader sense of things that you should look for. Yeah, I think one of the most powerful areas is the insights tool within Zyflow. Um, we provide a lot of kind of the high level summation reporting directly in the insights tool. The insights tool is going to allow, um, it really kind of covers the key points in a specific time period that you can filter on by a number of different criteria. You can look at 
how many versions were created, how many proofs were approved, how many proofs were late, and probably the most relevant is turnaround time. So how long did it take to, how many versions did it take for a proof to get approved, and how long did it take to get that approval? I think the turnaround time on just time and versions is probably the most, the two most powerful reporting aspects. And then you can drill down by subsetting your data and filtering it and figuring out, okay, can I, de uh, can I identify a trend on the bottleneck? Is it constantly this asset type? Is it constantly this reviewer? So looking at turnaround time is the first step to really understanding your analytics. Ah, great. That's great. Um, you know, the last question, actually, again, it was a product question. I, we appreciate all the uh, Zyphlo specific product questions. Um, the last question is, when it comes to submissions, can anybody submit a proof for review? Um, you know, there's a couple of different ways that we could handle this. Um, and I think the question comes down to kind of a license um, allocation. So um, for that person who asked that question, um, I've asked you for your email address. Um, I'd love to get in contact with you to talk about the different options we have. Um, um, we definitely do have capabilities via the API and whatnot to maybe uh, come up with a solution that you're looking for. So I appreciate the question. And I think, I think that handles it for the questions. So uh, I want to go ahead and uh, take the opportunity to, again, remind you of the free assessment offer. Um, uh, let me just go ahead and go back to full screen. I want to remind everyone of the free assessment offer at scifloacom slash assessment. Um, and at that, I also want to say thank you for everyone's time. We've gone a little bit over the hour. I want to thank everyone for hanging in there with us. Uh, and from both Will and I, I want to say have a great day. And uh, we'll be, uh, if you signed up for today's webinar, we'll be letting you know about our future webinars as well. So uh, we'd love to see you back on one of these discussions. Uh, thanks, everybody, and have a great day.